Hey guys, what's up? It is week 337, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's just hop right in through the reviews. I got a handful for you, and uh, just a couple things uh, that I picked up. So the first one up is from Era Video. This is one of their Paramount titles they're putting out, and this is The Desperate Hours. This is based off a novel. It's been remade a couple times, basic, a lot of stuff lifted from it, but there was a remake in, what, 1990, if I'm not mistaken, uh, by Michael Chimo with uh, uh, Mickey Rourke, Anthony Hopkins in it, uh, Elias Cotez, pretty, pretty David Moore. Morris, pretty decent movie. So I had actually never seen the original, and we got kind of some really good actors in here. We have Frederick March, who played uh, Dr. Jekyll at one point, and we have Humphrey Bogart, which I absolutely love seeing him in here as well. Um, Gig Young was in here, and of course, Arthur Kennedy. Arthur Kennedy will be known by horror fans and stuff like Let Sleeping Corpses Lie, and he's in a lot of Euro Polizia Tetsi. He ended up popping up in 1974's Antichrist, the Spanish, is it a Spanish, I think? Exorcist kind of ripoff, maybe it's a Spanish Italian co-production can't remember all the details but uh yeah and, and it also has some other people in here as well now, uh, the original story is essentially there's a, a pretty uh, a, a group of criminals that uh, have escaped. One of them, Humphrey Bogart, basically gets broken out of prison by his brother, and he escapes with another prison uh, inmate, and they end up taking refuge in this kind of upper middle class house. Um, now, the remake is a bit different than this one, of course. Uh, we have Mickey Rourke, who's a character who is like highly intelligent. Um, this one is definitely a battle of the classes. So Humphrey Bogart, being older than the character in the uh, play, the actual play. Um, they said it was played by what Paul Newman um, actually when he was younger so that's pretty pretty cool kind of get the give you the idea who it was and now we have Humphrey Bogart playing him so much older and uh, the thing I like about Humphrey Bogart is you know he's a, he's a great actor he's got a lot of charisma but he's not afraid to look stupid in movies he's not afraid to look kind of like an idiot a, a character that's dumb or weak or stuff like that he shows vulnerability in his characters his intelligence and in the, the care as his characters I, I just don't think a lot of people would want to do that um Especially nowadays when you hear stories about, you know, The Rock and Vin Diesel having have that same amount of punches at a movie. Fuck off with that stupid shit. But, uh, yeah, so, so you have basically um, Humphrey Bogart here as the lead of the criminals. And they invade this person's house. And there's a wife, a, a, a father, and a y older daughter who's dating Gig Young. Gig Young from Peck and Paw movies. Looking much younger and healthier in these films, of course. And a uh, young son. Uh, what is it? Ralphie now ralph because he's a grown boy so uh yeah it, it, this movie's really amazingly shot you think well how are you gonna have such depth and all this stuff and just like a house in an isolated house because most of the movie takes place in this house right but when they frame it there's characters in the back and the, the second floor the foreground the middle ground they use their depth and all that kind of stuff really well the the framing is excellent i mean it's it's a very well done movie i'm not gonna lie there it is perfect perfectly framed staged all that kind of stuff um and it's really brilliantly well acted. I love the kind of uh, animosity that March and Bogart have for each other in the film. It really works well. And Bogart looks pretty beaten down in it. I mean, as older, you know, this is not too soon. He died shortly after a couple years, if I'm not mistaken. He died pretty young, but he looks like, you know, he's he's a little wear, worn out looking, but he's great in it. Uh, there There's this character called Kabish, or Gabish, I can't think of his name, and he's basically the buffoon that escaped a prison with Bogart, and he is an excellent character. He is kind of this childlike uh, character, and I think that his performance is the one that stuck with me the most. Uh, he, he fights with a kid about stealing little airplane toys, and he almost gets off on the violence. He's definitely just such a primitive, and, and there's a a point where he tears the the place apart and uh what does bogart say he's a brood ain't he and he, he constantly messes with him and, and talks down on a lot of people and you can see the shift of power happen in the film when bogart starts to lose some of his power and everything like this arthur kennedy's a cop who put bogart away he's good in it he's solid he you know he's good at playing a cop i've seen him play a cop in almost everything right um what was the euro uh euro crime film where he played a cop i cannot think was it a, a umberto lenzi was it Tough Ones? Was he in Tough Ones? Um, but yeah, he, he's good in it as well. Um, and it's really exciting. There's also family drama. And March is really good too. He, he's got a great kind of father figure kind of demeanor. You like him. He's stern, but he's not a jerk and he's not over the top. And you can see him be disheveled. Uh, it's really uh, nerve-wracking, and it keeps your attention. You never get bored, and the movie is basically in a couple locations. Uh, yeah, it, it's good stuff, and it, it's, it's perfectly 
acceptable, wonderful movie that I'm sure everybody knows. William Wyler directed it. As far as the special features are concerned, we have uh, a few here. We have, of course, brand new film audio commentary by film historian Daniel Creamer. Trouble in Suburbia, brand new appreciation of the film by Jose Araro, uh, associate professor in film and television studies at the University of Warwick. The Lonely Man, brand new visual essay by uh, Elise uh, Ross, co-curator of the Melbourne uh, Cinematique. Um, if I, hopefully I said that wrong for sure. Scaled down and ratcheted up. Brand new audio interview with Kathleen Wilder, daughter of director William Wilder. Lobby cards, all that kind of stuff here. Yeah, the special features are pretty nice. They talk about a lot of the stuff that I mentioned in here. Um, probably do it better than I would, of course. But yeah, this is a really well done film. I was really happy with it. I prefer it much over the uh, the original, uh, the remake from the 1990. I think that the characters are more realistic. I think they're more grounded. I think the acting's better say that. I really do. I think Bogart and March are better than Hopkins and, and uh, Rourke. I know that might be an unpopular opinion. Hell, I even the only character I thought did a better job in the remake was, a uh, um, I think, Elias Cotes as the brother was really good and really strong over this brother. This brother is definitely kind of the young man deal in here. Kind of your typical kind of greasier kind of rebel without a cause style character. But he has, a, he has depth too. The characters have depth. They're interesting. And it's a really good film. I think that most people really enjoy it. It keeps you, you know, in a lot of intense stuff. You know, it does remind me of like Hitchcock films at the time. You know, how you're always constantly intrigued at the suspense. It's very suspenseful. Very well done. Really recommend The Desperate Hours. Great stuff. Looks great. Sounds great. Um, now, I can't remember if this had the uh, mono, mono 1.0, but the sound was pretty solid in this one. Enjoyed it. Great stuff. The Desperate Hours. Okay. The next one up here is from Honored Films. And this one was what, from 2008? Now, I covered this on here before, but this reissue kind of, uh, you know, I liked the movie originally when it came out in 2008. Then when I rewatched it, I was like, that was good, but not as good as I remembered. And I'm kind of gone back on this, and I like it as much as I did when it came out. This is Dead Girl, and this stars uh, um, Noah Sagan, and uh, who is the uh, guy who's in the Evil Dead remake here? Uh, Shyla Fernandez, Noah Sagan. And this is directed by a pair of directors here, Marcel Sacramento and Gotti Harley. But the name that most horror fans will know right off the bat here is is the person who wrote it, and that's Trent Haga. Trent Haga went on to write a bunch of other films. He was in horror films. He got to start at Troma and Citizen Toxie and everything like that, and a bunch of other movies. So, yeah. Um, I think, actually, some of the producers on here worked at Troma. Some of the other people did, too. So, anyways, Dead Girl. This is kind of like, you know, those, the whole run of high school movies, like Chub Scrubber and Brick and all those movies that came out. Um, what was the other? A lot of those films that came out like that. And that time, that had that kind of weird kind of high school kind of... Um, almost angst, but also like a, a certain style to it. And I, I don't want to say like punk kind of style, like the new wave kind of punk deal. It kind of reminded me of that. Like when I was growing up, you know, like the emo kids or punk kids, all those alternative kids would like these movies. And, you know, a lot of us were like that uh, when we were growing up in this time. So, so when dead girl came out, it was almost like a statement on that in a weird kind of darkly comedic way and a, and a screwed up extreme way too. It was kind of the extreme answer to those kind of high school dramas and those things like that. The high, it was the horror version of it. Um, it reminds me of something like Jack Ketchum would write as well, you know, but it has a, a like a biting satire and a comedy that Jack Ketchum, yeah, I, I'm sure he has that stuff in there, but I think that this is the better version, film version of A Girl Next Door. Because if you look at it, you can understand the character's motivations more so in this than you would The Girl Next Door film, not the book. The book, I think you can understand it, but the film, The Girl Next Door, just doesn't work for me as much as something like Dead Girl. <laughs> so here we have the plot, basically. We have Noah Segan and uh, Shia Love are basically best friends. Um, they really don't have much. They're kind of poor kids. And our lead character here, Fernandez, is obsessed with this kind of uh, this local girl that they once had a tiny little romantic thing when they were like 10. He's obsessed with her still, and he just kind of won't give up the ghost. His mom's not around too much, and her boyfriend's living with them, and Michael Bowen, who's excellent, who, speaking of Jack Ketchum, he was in the, the film adaptation The Lost, and he's great in that too, um, which is getting a reissue so shortly as well from, I think, Ronan Flicks, is it? Uh, maybe, possibly, we'll see. But uh, so, so anyways, what happens is um, the, the kids like to go to this kind of abandoned mental institution and screw around and have some drinks, and a dog chases them, and they end up going through some vents, and they end up in a kind of a strange hallway and they find this girl wrapped in plastic and they think she's dead they're gonna probably go find somebody but she kind of gasped to life and she doesn't seem to be mentally there at all and by the title suggests she's a dead girl she's a zombie 
So typically what normal people would do is leave the body, burn the body, go get somebody else that knows what's going on. But no Segan kind of having nothing in his life and being a little bit more advanced um, mentally, but also not advanced in a lot of ways in terms of like his immaturity levels, but intelligence, I guess, um, advanced. I don't even call that intelligence. What I would call is maybe maybe foresight of who he is and where he's going to end up in life because he doesn't think much of himself. And he does something rather repulsive and disgusting. He decides to start sleeping with the dead girl, using her as a sex slave. She's very bitey, but uh, they, they take care of that. And uh, as the movie progresses, obviously our lead character is haunted by it, and it's going to involve more than just these two. Some other kid come down there, comes down there and another friend, and other people are introduced to dead girl, um, some in a sexual way and some more in a physically harmful way. Um, so, yeah, it, it's really gross. Um, now, the shining light of this movie is Noah Segan, and he would go on to do stuff like Knives Out and a bunch of other movies. He was not Brick, actually, I think. So he is excellent in this. His dialogue is great. His delivery is great. He knows the comedy beats. He knows when to pause everything about it his performance is brilliant actually and that is the first time i kind of registered how good he was in this movie he just this is the best we're gonna have man you just don't get it he's just so dead on of a character he takes his character that if it wasn't played right would you wouldn't buy it you would not buy this but for some reason his demeanor everything about him it works you, you buy this character because you think it's going to take a strange kind of fellow, a person with these weird kind of motivations or thinking differently to want to screw a corpse. But, you know, it's that that horrible, you know, ungodly, you know, horny thing that kids had when uh, teenagers had. Right. Um, and it's just elevated to the most ridiculous, darkly comedic and disgusting and uh, kind of extreme way. Um, it, it's really well done. The effects are good. It's, it's like I said, it's very darkly funny. Um, the music's great, uh, very much of its time, kind of haunting, almost like folky kind of stuff at times, but maybe alternative, very much what you would expect to hear in this kind of stuff. Um, I like it. Uh, kind of like just song, uh, slowed down lyrics and, and kind of haunting kind of visuals at the same time with it. But yeah, it's a, it's a kind of coming of age story as well, which works really well, like Super Dark Times or any of those movies that uh, were reflecting those movies from that time or really from that time. But uh, it's excellent. It's excellent, honestly. It's really good. I'd be hard pressed to find that many more movies I liked more than Dead Girl from 2008. Now also, it looks good. It sounds good. And another thing that I really liked was a lot of the features here. So they went all out on the special features here, new interviews, tons of new stuff on here and people that, you know, you, you don't, you, you're kind of surprised would want to talk about it still. So new interview with co-director Gadi Harrell, new interview with writer Trent Haga. Trent Haga talks about this, working with Troma, trying to get Lloyd to do it, but then realizing, you know, they're not really going to do it. It's not really their style. New interview with actor Noah Segan. I, that's, that says a lot. I mean, this guy's in a big Hollywood movies now coming back to talk about this 2008 movie where he fucks a dead a zombie. Obviously has some an admiration for the film, which I like to see. New interview with actor Shyla Fernandez. Um, Shillo, I, I'm not sure how to say his first name, actually. That's a good interview as well. New interview with special fake up. Uh, special makeup effects artist and designer Jim uh, Ojala and he, he's an interesting guy he talks about scalping the face to making it really like hamburger after she got beat up and then realizing they went too far new behind the scenes gallery new extended makeup FX gallery audio commentary with cast and crew audio commentary by actor uh, Jenny Spain uh, exquisite corpse the making of dead girl Jenny Spain's audition deleted scenes promotional still galleries theatrical trailer new blu-ray ROM PDF of dead girl shooting script and dead girl 2 first draft so yeah this does end on a super dark note um great movie and obviously those are lips but um they're they're the wrong way if you're catching my drift dead girl great stuff recommended and uh if you like haven't seen it and you like a lot of movies from that time and you like on earth films this is a must on earth is doing a great job i'm so happy with the stuff they've been putting out they put out the august underground the first two the third one's common but all those on earth classic lines like dr lamb and untold story just love it i love it great, great stuff Okay, this next one here is from Arrow Video, and this is a 4K of Peter Weir directed film, Witness, starring um, Harrison Ford here, Lucas Haas, um, 
Jeez, I can't believe I'm going to... Uh, Kelly McGillis. i got a great little cast here. Also, Danny Glover is in this bad boy. Viggo Morgensern has a tiny role. The, the main goon from Die Hard. So it's got a great cast. Um, this one I had heard about for years and never actually got a chance to watch. Peter Weir directed Picnic at Hanging Rock from 1975. He's an Australian director. Um, yeah, so first and foremost, this one takes place in kind of like the Dutch Amish kind of, a da Amish kind of world, where it is the same place that uh, Apprentice to Murder takes place, the Donald Sutherland film, which is a cool film. We've got a great look. This one has the same kind of look, the same background, the same feel. Um, interesting to kind of have these like murder mysteries or thrillers in this background of the Dutch uh, Dutch Amish. Um, yeah, so first and foremost, this movie's gorgeous looking. The depth and everything. Again, I keep using that word, but it, it's, it's lit really well because it's like dark in a lot of ways and you see a lot of detail, but it's not overly dark. It's not desaturated of color. So it just looks really good. I, that's the first thing I kind of would want to mention. So Harrison Ford plays a police detective and um, he basically has an Amish kid who witnesses a brutal murder in the bathroom. And what happens is this Amish kid comes to talk about it with his mother and Kelly McGillis. And they're kind of going through perps and he spots somebody in the police station files who you wouldn't think would be the actual person who committed the murder. So it turns out to be a cop and Harrison Ford goes to his supervisor and tells him, turns out that these guys were you know drug fda guys or something along that and they made this big drug bust and the drugs never got put in so he's catching on to this that these guys are in on it uh it turns out that um everybody comes after harrison ford so there's a rat in you know the, the police station he ends up running to the amish territory he gets injured so he has to stay there and him and kelly mcgillis to kind of start to form this relationship obviously her husband has passed and he's a fish out of water he doesn't know what he's doing um the love story is really well done. It works really well. Everything is subtle in this film, like a lot of facial expressions. In fact, one of the the video essays here is talking about how the movie is a lot of showing and not telling. And that's filmmaking 101. It does that a lot. But I would admit that it does say that about the actors doing it too. And I, I agree with that. I agree with that assessment for sure. Because the facial expressions that a lot of these actors make are subtle. They're not over the top, but they get their, they convey their message across, which is not easy to do. So I really thought that was something special. Harrison Ford's great in it. He's always a good actor, but, you know, he's so... He's always playing these big roles, right? Like Indiana Jones or Han Solo. But so when he gets to do something a little bit different, it is kind of refreshing to see him be a cop in here and just kind of like a normal kind of cop kind of guy. Um, it's a beautiful looking movie. I mean, there's a lot of countryside, a lot of Amish uh, territories and everything. And they always kind of like have are really well shot because where they're at they have access to tons of nice little places and everything and it's interesting to look at a culture too and uh him being the fish out of the water is entertaining the bad guys are good and i love the call he makes to somebody that he knows from his past and they do things off screen even though it's a longer film there's a couple things that are off screen that are effective too um regardless i really like this film i thought it was really well shot well directed well acted no complaints the 4k looked fantastic um the sound was solid too you got three different choices here you got the theatrical sound you got the the home video sound and then you got a 5.1 mix so you got three different choices here and as far as the special features are concerned there's a slew of them brand new audio commentary by film mystery jared uh gahan um Brand new video interview with cinematographer John Seal, and this was his first American film. Um, he was an Australian guy, and he, I think, worked with um, Peter Weir before, but he does a great job here. His first American uh, DP film. Brand new video essay on film's performances by film journalist and Stacey Lynn Wilson. That's good stuff. Vintage 1985 interview with Harrison Ford discusses witness and critic Bobby uh, Wygant, and that's great, too, because Harrison Ford basically seven minutes talks about the movie. Pretty down-to-earth, pretty quiet kind of guy. Talks about not wanting to do any more Han Solo roles so we saw how that ended and then we have between two worlds five part archival documentary on the making of phil featuring interviews with harrison ford kelly mcgillis peter Ware, john seal producer edward s Philman, and actors lucas haas patty lapone and vigo morgensen that's great they talk about how they got this film made um all that all the things like that and vigo morgensen talks about being on the set when it was kind of his first early days this is one of his first roles he did he doesn't have many lines but he's in the background the entire film he says he got a good experience kelly mcgillis basically gets a little sad at the end because she talks about, you know, this was a great experience with Ford and Peter Weir and, you know, it, it just never really was that good again is basically what she says, which is unfortunate and I know that she doesn't really act anymore. Then we have a conversation with Peter Weir, archival interview with the film's director, deleted scene from network TV version of the film, theatrical trailer, image gallery, limited edition, packaging with reversible sleeve featuring original newly commissioned artwork by Tommy Pocket, limited edition, 60 page, perfect bound booklet illustrated by Tommy Pocket featuring new writing on the film by Dennis uh, Kapsalik, 
uh, Martin uh, Contario, John Harrison, and Amanda Reyes. Fold out double sided poster featuring original new commission artwork by Tommy Pocket. Six double sided collectors postcards. So, yeah, it's got a lot of stuff going for it. Really excellent film. I would recommend this one for sure, especially fans of this one. It's uh, no DVD in here or Blu ray, just a 4K. Looks great, sounds great. Witness, check it out. So, I'll be brief with this one because I am going to talk about this one on uh, Lacey uh, Lou's pod and Dan Chase's podcast, Cut to the Chase. And this is is Pumpkinhead. This is a 1988 classic film here directed by legendary effects artist Stan Winston and starring Lance Hendrickson. It also has Buck Flower in it and uh, Carrie Remsen, I think is her name. Um, what else is she in? Uh, yeah, yeah, Carrie Remsen. She pops up and stuff like Ghoulies too, which is one of my favorites. That's how I recognized her. But yeah, Pumpkinhead. Uh, this is a really great kind of folk horror film on 4K here. Um, so yeah, Anyways, the story of Pumpkinhead follows kind of a backwoods kind of guy. Lance Hendrickson is a young kid. There, basically, he's a single father. He runs this little hardware store, and as a kid, he witnesses kind of this horrible, you know, act. Um, uh, his father actually is played by uh, Sal from RoboCop. He's also Redbeard in Hunter's Blood. Uh, you know, uh, Sal from RoboCop. He's great in that. Never miss a game, Sal. Tigers play tonight. So, uh, yeah. He's in this very beginning, and he witnesses the pumpkinhead creature that this uh, this little like song is later sung about it. This kind of poem, and you kind of register what's happening here. Like no one can get involved with the pumpkinhead once the pumpkinhead is after somebody, it won't stop. So you get a glimpse of that in the very beginning, and you you kind of hear also this kind of kind of folky kind of backwoods place has all their kind of things like that kids walking around with no shoes on and country bumpkin overalls all this kind of stuff here buck flowers the patriarch of this big family he's got a bunch of grandkids with him but uh what happens is there's a group of kind of like kids looking the party and there's one major asshole who wants a dirt bike on there he's drunk he's dirt biking he's 18 years old he's played by a 40 year old as it was uh, the custom of the time so what happens is uh he accidentally hits lance hendrickson's kid and lance hendrickson knowing about the legend of Pumpkinhead, hears and, and basically goes and finds out where this old witch is um one of the amazing performances in this film honestly is the witch and puts a curse on these kids, and they basically, you know, when you you have revenge, dig two graves, right? And we have this whole story about Lance Hendrickson and having to suffer through the revenge that he chose. Uh, the monster in Pumpkinhead is a a excellent. Its design is scary. It's long. It's lanky. It's got a strange head. It moves weird. There has never really been another monster like Pumpkinhead. Now, it does have some kind of uh, things that are similar to the Xenomorph in Aliens, but it's not necessarily like anything else. Um, Pumpkinhead has one of the coolest, scariest monsters of all time. I'm glad they went with the back of the old VHS on the cover because this VHS was one of my all-time favorite VHSs. Um, there's a stand out of this, and I would love that. This is just, just says everything about Pumpkinhead. And and the fact, the first couple deaths in here are brutal. Pumpkinhead like, likes to drag things out in a real kind of brutal fashion. It's really effective, really scary. Um, now, the movie does seem like it might a lot of it might be on a set or very much on a location. It's one or the other because there's so much crazy shit going on, tons of wind and just thick atmosphere i'm just like they i feel like they had to have some sort of a controlled environment for a lot of this but there was just tons of fog and wind and you hear the cicadas crying in the night um love all that stuff it's just great it really captures that small town kind of folk feel it's great stuff it's a, it was a childhood favorite it still holds up had three sequels the second one by jeff burr r.i.p uh jeff burr passed away a couple weeks ago very sad anthony hickox also passed away r.i.p two directors that i had they made movies that I had a great fondness for. So that's very, very sad. Two underrated guys. So RIP guys. But uh, yeah, this Pumpkinhead 4K um, has old features from the Blu-ray on here, of course. Um, and we have new for we have audio commentary by co-writers Gary Giraldi and creature um, and FX creators Tom Woodruff and Al G G Gillis, moderated by filmmaker Scott Spiegel who's fake and skinned alive. Then we have disc two. We, here's all the features on here. Night of the Demon interview with co-writer Richard Wyman. Redemption of Joel interview with actor Joe DeQuano. The Boy with Glasses interview with actor Matthew Hurley. Audio commentary with Gary Garoni. That's the same one. Pumpkin Hand on Earth, a six-part documentary of making a film, remembering the monster kid, a tribute to Stan Winston, demonic toys, a look at the creation of the Pumpkin Head action figure. So there we go. Uh, yeah, great stuff. I really recommend checking out Pumpkin Head if you never did. It's perfect for the holiday season. Um, God damn you, woman.
He already has. He already has. Great line. Um, anyways, great stuff. Love Pumpkinhead. Uh, I think you guys will too. Okay, the next two I'm going to cover here are actually available on YouTube for free right now. They're directed by Seb Godain, and uh, he uh, they are a filmmaker, and they're from Canada. Uh, I've known Seb for a very long time. They're a great person. Uh, love Seb. So, I, in fact, I actually got my early start making shorts and their films. So, yeah, they asked me to talk about a couple of their films. So here we go. The first one is The Blood Rites of the Vampire. And this one is a black and white one and it is in the style of a John Roland movie. And it's got, um, you know, it, it's it's short, it's low budget, but it's kind of like nightmarish. And my favorite part is right in the opening of the film. It's very Lovecraftian where this guy is having these nightmares and he goes to this kind of monk and he's talking to him about these nightmares. And the monk's like, why would you go to me? And this monk is played by Anthony Mann, I think is his name. And he's an excellent actor. He's up, he's actually in the next one as well. Great actor actor here uh this monk here um for independent films i'm just like oh this guy is very good man this guy is is great so what happens is he tells him this nightmare and he tells him about this grave and the monk gets very scared he says never go to that grave and he's like it's a real grave so this kind of starts this chain reaction of this vampire to be awoken from her slumber and she kind of goes around the city uh, feasting on whoever she can find until you know her untimely demise in classic jean roland fashion now this one's this one's solid it's short um i I don't like this one nearly as much as the next one but the next one's definitely more my jam i i did like this one though i I thought that the the music was good um for the most part i thought the atmosphere was solid it was kind of nice to see gothic meets city so this one's decent this is blood of the vampire and uh yeah so we're gonna hop into the second one here directed by uh seb Godain, and this is the abominations of frankenstein that's a great title matches up with all the hammer and universal titles and I, just, I can't believe that one hasn't been done so this one is again uh just over an hour long and right when i put this in i love the colors i love the sets on a low budget really worked really well and again our lead here is this anthony p man character and I, I hope i'm i got his actor name right and he's playing Baron von Frankenstein. And this is such a good performance. Now, he's wearing goggles, right, over his eyes. And you can still get across all his, for the most part, for the most of the film, you can still get across his acting. And that's hard because, I mean, the eyes are really a big part of acting. If you don't have your eyes, you're kind of fucked in a lot of ways. And he manages to act with his body and his, his other facial features, his eyes covered, and he does a great job. The dialogue and all the stuff he has it is wonderful. He has a helper who helps him go pick, uh, you know, obviously victims up to become his next monster. But there's another cool detail in here as well. This is kind of obviously like if Frankenstein was a real person and they based the novel off them and everything like that. So Mary Shelley's actually in this, but Mary Shelley's kind of like this this a ghost from beyond and always is like taunting Dr. Frankenstein. And their back and forth is actually great. Um, I think that Mary Shelley's really good and Dr. Frankenstein is really good and they're back and forth arguing is excellent stuff and talking. And there's points in this where like there's long no like long uh, shots, no cutting. And there's tons of dialogue between these two and I'm just looking at it and I'm like, that's a lot for an actor an actress. That's a lot, man. And they, they do a great job. They never, it doesn't seem like they, they knew their lines very well. So like for an independent film, I think just in general, I think the acting is really solid between those two. I liked it. The other performances are good too. Um, and you kind of have some reveals. This one is, is uh, a much more my jam. I enjoyed this one quite a bit. Um, it's not overly gory or anything like that, but there's some fun touches. Very good for like kind of like a late October night just to pop on if you ain't got much time. It's like an hour and two minutes. It's on YouTube. The links will be below. I would recommend watching both of them. The Abominations of Frankenstein and Blood Rites of the Vampire. Now, the Frankenstein one is totally up my alley, so I would watch that one first. And if you really like that one, go to the the Vampire one as well. It's kind of crazy. Seb has done so many different movies. They've done a werewolf movie, a mummy movie, a dinosaur movie, a little creatures movie, a vampire movie, and a Frankenstein movie. Where's your creature movie? A. You're not not going fast enough. You need a creature from the Black Lagoon movie. And then you need, uh, what else do you need? A zombie movie? How about a zombie creature from the Black Lagoon movie? There you go. Also, I do want to see, um, Seb, help me make this movie. Vampire of the Opera. That's right. The Phantom is performing, um, and Count Dracula is fresh in Paris, and he sees this marquee of Christine, and it looks like a lost love. He goes in to see the play, comes infatuated with her. The Phantom won't let her go that easy. So there's traps that Dracula has to go through to figure out who each other are, and they're at each other's throats. So the Vampire of the Opera. That's great, right? 
both of them. That's a, that's a monster mash fight there. Great stuff. Anyways, uh, enjoy these movies. I think they, hopefully you guys will get a chance to watch them. They're free on, uh, for uh, the whole month of October. So you'll have a few days when this comes out to check them out. Please do. All right, guys, let's get into those 1981 movies. Eh. Woe be unto him who opens one of the seven gateways to hell, because through that gateway, evil will invade the world. First one up is Violence and Flesh from Impulse Pictures. It's a classy Brazilian film. Uh, get your pervert card out ASAP. This is a very pervert heavy movie. The classic Latin erotica collection. Classic. So uh, Brazilian movies, you know, they're fucking insane a lot of times. Like the horror movies and the, the erotica and the exploitation and shit like that. 
So I, I, there's a nice little insert in here, which I kind of like. Just want to read the the front here. So we have uh, the porno uh, chinchada film was a genre of filmmaking which occurred in Brazil roughly between 76 and 84. Starting as a fairly controversial film movement in the very Catholic country, these films rose to popularity during a political dictatorship that was governing Brazil at the time. Much to the surprise of the movie producers, the government actually advocated the production of these erotic films and gave film producers near total freedom from the censorship of sex and violence as long as the films did not address political and social issues. Despite the genre name containing the word porno, most of these films were softcore productions along some directors would include hardcore scenes from time to time. Many of these films proved to be box office gold during these years and by 1980, the peak of the movement, there were over 100 erotic features produced in Brazil each year until 1984. Some Brazilian directors of talent offered their craft to the um, production of the uh, porno uh, chanchada films. Fe filmmakers such as Alfredo Sternheim, Adi Fraga, Fauzi Mansour, and Walter Hugo Corny all made their name and money in the erotic movie production. And violence and flesh is no different. So we kind of have this... I guess it's kind of like the Desperate Hours meets the last house, uh, house on the edge of the park, last house on the left. So we have these three criminals, real sleaze bags. Um, one of them is total, just like Krug ripoff. He, he's not as smart or as demented or as well acted as Krug, but he's got the curly hair and he's just going to fuck every single person there. But he has a little soft, maybe he's like a weasel and Krug mixed or something like that. Then we have this kind of uh, overweight guy who used to be like this pimp and he's missing a tooth and he's like, and he's balding. And then we have this kind of um, almost like terrorist kind of guy with him who's like got a reason for his murders and everything like that so these three uh basically kidnap this guy while he's driving and they force him back to drive to the house and again we have this classism thing they go into this rich actor's house or this director and all the actors are there and the models and everything like that they force everybody in there's a pair of lesbian girls there is a, uh the guy who's forced in has a homosexual partner and the young dancer there as well and then we have a uh, uh you know, an actress and a couple actresses and one has a boyfriend there and everything like that, an overly jealous boyfriend. So basically, of course, you know what's going to happen, right? This is an erotica, nasty kind of, uh, I guess you'd call even like a roughie for, for Brazil Ruffy. And this is very similar to the Brazilian movie Rape of the Virgins, which is nasty, where it's just Rape Fest 2000. Everybody's getting raped. So this one has a lot of rape in it. Um, uh, so be warned if that's not uh, something that you want to see or you can take. So violence and flesh. Uh, so basically they start to kind of degrade them. And they, they obviously that, that idea of rape is there right in the beginning. Not from the political guy. He has a morals effect. So... The, one of the actors immediately kind of starts falling for this political guy, which is nonsense. It's it's very, very forced and silly. You're just like, okay, whatever. I know this is just kind of the, move, the catalyst to move the story along. But uh, there is a point where, you know, the one kind of brut brutish guy rapes a bunch of them. Rapes like three, four people in this movie. He, he wanders off at one point and like kills somebody. He's just a complete fucking idiot. But there is a male rape scene, which I didn't expect to see. And I was like, oh, there's that. Um, and eventually, one of the characters kind of stands up in your basic kind of rape revenge kind of style film. The ending is very silly how it ends. Not, not necessarily silly, but just like... <laughs> The action's not really well done, really, when it comes to that kind of stuff. It's not an amazingly well done action film. It is sleazy. It is trashy. There is a degrading moments where the bad guys belittle all the people. They obviously are upset with the classic stuff, the classism stuff. And you know, it says not political or social issues, but they do talk about the stuff in here. Maybe it's not too forced in your face, but it is there. A violence and Flesh, if you like these kind of movies, if you're looking for, you're like, I just love rape revenge movies and uh, I'm out of American and European ones, then maybe look towards South America or, you know, you know, um, or, or Mexico too, because they, they got their own too. Like, that's what I'm saying is people are like, I've seen every movie. It's like, have you seen all these Brazilian horror movies? You know, have you seen all these movies from Eastern Europe that don't have something? Have you seen all these South Korean movies from 1970 to 1988? I kind of doubt you have because there's tons of them. So anyways, if you like this one, um, or if you like this kind of stuff, sounds like it's something up your alley, check out Violence and Flesh. Okay, the next 1981 movie is uh, Tales of the Haunted or Evil Stalks This House. I think it's Evil This House, yeah. So this is a strange one. In 1981, they tried to do this kind of like television show um, called Tales of the Haunted or Haunted. It's Haunted, and it was hosted by Christopher Lee. That stuff is lost. You can't find it. But what did surface on YouTube, um, and you can find it, is the 45-minute version. I don't know if it's longer. Originally said it was a lot longer. Of the Jack Palant story. So this also has Mike Starr in it, Jack Plant. It has um, the second grade teacher from Billy fucking Madison. Madison has a couple of young people you recognize. Has the little girl from The Brood in here. 
Yeah, she's in here as well. Um, so essentially what we have here is Jack plants his car breaks down. He's way too old to have these two young kids, but he does. He ends up having to stop at this kind of this home or this run by these two old ladies. And they have like kind of a mentally challenged like border or son or something like that. And Mike Starr, Mike Starr's a really good actor the year before he was in cruising. Right. And he would be in dumb and dumber. Good fella. It's just a good actor. He's solid in this. Um, uh, so basically what happens is Jack plants realizes, I want to stick around here because these old broads got money. That's what he says. I don't know if he actually says that, but he's the kind of guy that would say that. So um, he starts to kind of try to figure out how to find their gold and hidden money. In the basement, for some reason, there's a vat of quicksand. I, I don't know why you wouldn't cover that up. Well, maybe they don't cover it up because the two old ladies are witches or something. They belong to a cult. I don't know. It's a glimpse of that. They're in a cult. Um, so, yeah. And, and, like, the little kids are hanging out with Mike Starr because they kind of have similar mentalities. Uh, uh, so what happens is a new handyman comes in. And Jack Palance is a pure asshole in this movie. He had taken away one of the old lady's pills that she needs for her heart. And he's like, you tell me where the gold is and I'll give you your pills. Because I don't know why, but, like, towards the end of Jack Palance's career, he'd always be like, yeah. He'd always, like, breathe in and say anything. Even that torture guard movie, he's like, Edgar, Edgar, Alan, go. I, I love Jack Plans. I love his performance. He's great in this. He's such a fucking prick. He's, he's just good. He's great in it. So another handyman comes in and they start to butt heads. It's going to end tragically for all the bad guys in this one. It's a just desserts kind of Tales in the Crypt story. But if you ever were like, you know what? I'd like to see Jack Plants play a mentally handicapped person. Then this one's for you. This is uh, evil that stalks the house. Would probably be higher if I could see the damn it. The quality is terrible. But, hey, it's a good, interesting look at Jack Plants and TV in 1981. TV movies. I like it. It's What other TV movies? Dark Knight of the Scarecrow was 81. It's not beating that, but it's beating a lot of the other ones, for sure. This House Possessed, it's better than that. I like it. This is Evil Stalks the House. The next one is a Bollywood one from 1981. That's right. So that means it's 2 hours and 17 minutes. I love that. So, uh, yeah. Anyways, this is... Uh, is this a... Um, uh, Ramsey movie it probably is but so this is like two hours and 17 minute movie and <laughs> you know it, they do seem a little long there's a couple of musical numbers in here and I was reading a lot of the reviews like only 30 minutes is horse that's not true there's a little bit more horror than that in here and I actually ended up liking this one so in the Bollywood movie, sometimes they'll have a bunch of comedy you don't need. Sometimes they'll have dance numbers you don't think you need. But yeah, this one follows the story. It's not the only hotel, uh, the movie about a hotel, of course. Well, this year we have The Beyond, um, a haunted hotel. And this is a haunted hotel indeed. So uh, they basically build this hotel on an ancient burial ground. Okay, that's a great idea. But... The way they get this hotel to be done is they kind of, there's a group of them. Like this guy wants to build this hotel who has the money. So he hires this guy to do it. And this guy is a shysty piece of shit. So he calls in like a lawyer friend, a couple other people. Before it's over, he's got like six or seven people helping him to get this deal done. They lie to a priest that say they're going to build this uh, orphanage for kids on this property. But instead they build this hotel. When this priest sees what happened, this old kindly man, he drops dead of a heart attack on the property. So this pisses off the spirits and everything like that. Um, one of the guys who was like friends with the hotel owner's brother finds out. So lots of bad things happen there. And after the hotel is, is, is there, a bunch of crazy guests come in, including a past love of our hotel's owner, who's not a bad guy, not in on the horrible stuff. So his past love is married to this drunkard. So yeah, he, he's just uh, like, obviously there's a romantic love story involved here. And so what happens is, of course, all the people that were involved here, there's like eight of them. And they're well-established characters that you fall, you, you're around them a lot of times. I love the lawyer because the lawyer loses his mind. He's like, I've never done anything illegal my whole life and you're ruining me. And, and like, there's like lots of good characters for it is. Because you're there with two hours and 17 minutes and they really truly take the time to develop these people. So instead of just having like an hour and a half where you're like, oh, that's that guy, he's okay. I know a lot of like old movies could get like a character actor and they'd be in the movie for four minutes and still develop an excellent character. Like Dark Knight of Scarecrow, all those guys aren't in it that much. There's four of them and they're all great character actors. They all do a great job. Charles in it a lot, but you know, like I mean, uh, Elaine Smith and um, uh, the the big the heavy guy Claude Earl Jones aren't in it that much, and they do a great job. 
Um, and so, so like, yeah, it's doable for sure if you have good character action. These guys are probably character actors in, in India, but they're good. And what happens is they all get picked off in crazy ways, chandeliers falling on people, people getting, like, most ridiculous ways, like glass breaking in their face, spikes in the chest. It, it's relatively gory, and there's, like, these ghost zombies that show up. Yeah, um, kind of similar to the Beyond, huh? Same year. But ghost zombies show up and everything like that. It's entertaining. I enjoyed it. There's a big fight scene at the end. It's, it's crazy. Somebody gets right, like, they, they take the time to give these people extra deaths, like extra crazy over the top deaths. Hotel's much better than expected. I really enjoyed it. There is a funny subplot, which is not funny to 90% of people, but I'm dumb and like outdated, terrible humor that I know is probably offensive. But that whole ordeal where like somebody's supposed to like, there's this side character who's like an, a director and he like starts to be infatuated with this woman who's married and she's married to like this big bruiser guy who has like this little mustache. And anyways, uh, he tries to give her a drink to make uh, her fall in love with him. But of course, you know, the husband drinks it. So now this big bruiser husband husband's acting like oh i love you and it's just like okay we get it it's stupid but i couldn't help but laugh because it's just but and, and it's so stupid and, and it's just in the movie for no apparent reason whatsoever i don't know if these are like two cat actors that everyone loves and they're like like they're abbott and costello or something but it's like i don't know why they're in here like it doesn't add anything to the plot except like a 15 minute like extra jokes but anyways i enjoyed hotel and uh I don't know. Give it a shot. I, I think you guys would like it. I'm going to try to watch a little bit more Indian movies. I didn't watch any, I think, from 1980, which is a shame. There's a couple. Maybe I'll go back and watch a couple of those. But I, I know there's a couple here with subtitles. There's a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde Indian movie that I'm going to watch. Um, and there's a couple other ones, too, that don't have subs. I might try the AI-generated subs. Uh, my computer is old, so I can't do, like, the top-rated subs. So, like, I might have some shaky subs. Won't be the first time. I've been doing it on some of them. I've been adding subtitles to some of these now myself if they don't have them. Uh, shaky subs, definitely. But anyways, hotel, uh, good stuff. Okay, the next 1981 movie is The Island of the Evil Spirits. Now, this is a Japanese horror film, and in, in reality, like from 1980, you look at it, there's not that many Japanese horror films. There's a lot of pinky that kind of cross into horror, pinky violence, all that kind of stuff like that, uh, Nakatsu movies, but they're not really like making horror films, like ghost stories and stuff like that. Now, South Korea was, but um, Hong Kong is. Um, a lot of these, Indonesia is, they're all making them. But Japan wasn't making them so much, which is kind of crazy. Thailand even, but so Japan, Taiwan too. But Japan wasn't, and they had those Nakatsu movies, but they weren't necessarily horror films. They had stuff like Virus, which is borderline horror. This one is horror, I think. It, it's got a mystery to it, but it, it's 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 again borderline horror. It's got a crime kind of style to it. Now. There is some supernatural aspects to it, and this is the Island of the Evil Souls, and this is, again, over two hours long, so I was putting it off watching it. So, But right when I started, I was like, oh, this is really well made. It's by the recognizable, um, interesting lead guy here trying to figure everything out. I would recommend this one. Also, uh, it ends with a uh, Beatles cover, Let It Be, and it's, it, it worked and touching. But this is a good one. This is kind of an, a little gem, maybe a little gem that not many people have seen, the Island of the Evil Spirits, a uh, Japanese film. And I know there's some more Japanese ones, too, I think, this year that I'll be checking out. But I'm kind of interested as we go through the 80s when that big Japanese boom hits. Is it like Sweet Home? I know that one comes up. And then um, when we start getting to more, like, by the mid mid to late 80s, there's dozens and dozens of these direct-to-video crazy movies like the, the guinea pig movies. But, like, right now we're in that Nakatsu world. Nakatsu world. And eventually we'll get even get to uh, Hisiasu Sato. So, like, it, it, we're going to get into a lot of weird shit later on in Japan. But right now, Japan... Japan's output is not huge for 1981, 1980. Um, and Hong Kong is, is there, and I know that they go for a couple more years with their horror films, but they start to slow down too, from my understanding. Then they probably pick back up in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. So it's just interesting watching the trajectory of all these countries, where their outputs were in different years. But anyways, uh, this one's good. I recommend The Island of the Evil Spirits. Okay, next up is the Patreon pick, and I can't remember who picked this, but this is The Pope's Exorcist. That's right. Starring Russell Crowe. I love Russell Crowe. Um, when he did that Unhinged movie, nothing made me happier than watching Russell Crowe play John Goodman and r drive trucks through cop cars and run people over. Which is fucking awesome. I don't think, man, I don't think you know what a bad day is. So Russell Crowe kind of in this crazy phase, like the nice guys, he's great in that too. Like big Russell Crowe, I love Big Russell Crowe. He's killing it. But he's always been a great actor. So this one he plays the Pope's exorcist based on a true story. He was this Italian guy that supposedly exercised so many cases. Whatever you believe, it doesn't matter. This is a movie loosely based on a true story. So uh, 
first thing I notice is how well shot this is. The set design is wonderful. Production design is great. Uh, it's shot wonderfully. So it's like well directed. It's well acted by Crow in here. The story is very bland though. It's very generic. It's very generic, bland, exorcist stuff. Not horrible, just not much to keep my interest here when you can just watch The Exorcist. And I know people are like, but you watch all these different slashers? I don't know. I like slashers. I, I don't like that many possession movies unless they're different. And this one's not very much different. So we have this mother um, and a fa what is it? A mother, a daughter, and a, a son. And their fathers died. They, the only thing they inherited was this like large kind of religious building in Rome or somewhere around that area, Italy forgive me and of course there's something behind the walls and a gust of smoke goes into the kid's face and the kid is possessed and the kid has these big kind of long lines and everything like that and russell crowe's treat kind of like takes this young priest under his wing that's there that knows about the story and everything and he and russell crowe it's up to them the young and the old priest to stop this you know possessed kid from fucking shit up um, overall, it's an okay movie like i said it's well directed it's well acted especially by crow um I don't know if anyone else is too good in it. They're not bad in it, but they're not memorable. No one else is really memorable. The kid does a good job. He's got a lot to deal with, a lot to do, a lot of cuss words, a lot of crazy shit coming out of his mouth, and he looks wild possessed. Looks wild. But uh, Russell Crowe's good in it. That's all I can say. It's well directed, and Russell Crowe's great. He's got a lot of jokes. But as far as that is concerned, this is kind of a bland movie for me. I don't think I would revisit it. I, I might if maybe my friend wanted to watch it, but it had a really hard time keeping my attention. It's again, it's not my genre of choice, especially nowadays. Um, but it, like I said, it's not a poorly done movie. It makes me feel like an asshole. But uh, like, you ever watch something that's well directed and it's just the writing? You're like, why? Why do this though? I mean, like then again, I got to remember that 90% of people haven't watched 20,000 Exorcist movies or 20,000 horror movies. So, you know, they're they're fine with something being normal or average or bland even. But maybe I'm not. So um, I'm not. I'm fine with it. Like, I like it just well enough. It's just that uh, I don't love it and I don't want to watch it again. But that's The Pope's Exorcist. Check it out if it sounds like it's up your alley. Okay, let's get into these questions, comments, concerns. Ken Coakley, 3959. I thought Pumpkinhead was one of Lance Hendrickson's best films. I love the scenes between Hendrickson and the boy. My father died when I was five years old, so I like films with father and son relationships. One of your viewers mentioned seeing Goblin Live with Demons. Um, I saw Goblin a few years ago at my local theater. They were playing to Suspiria. After the movie, they did the stuff from Deep Red, Dawn of the Dead, Tenebrae. I was so excited to see that you were reviewing Shock Treatment. I remember the film coming out in 81, but didn't get to see it until I rented it. I ended up having a crush on Jessica Harper. Who didn't? She was, in my opinion, a better Janet than Susan Sarandon. Agreed. Roger Ebert, who panned it, said that Jessica Harper didn't have a good singing voice. I thought, are we talking about the same person? You know what? Like, honestly, I bet if everyone went back and looked at what Roger Ebert had to say, I bet 90% of that shit's complete bullshit. I just don't, like, I don't really, like, I know, like, he did a lot for some movies, but, like, I don't, I, I mean, I like to like movies. Roger Ebert doesn't. I mean, sometimes he does. I don't know. I, you know, tastes have changed so much. I, I like also trash. I've just sat here and told you how great, like, you know, like, this movie about, like, uh, Jack Palance acting mentally handicapped a must-see. So maybe I'm just wacky. Um, see, this wasn't the original idea for the Rocky Horror sequel. The original idea was Janet being pregnant with Frank Furter's baby. Frank Furter also comes back from the dead. The song The Oscar Drill and the Bits play in Shock Treatment was really going to be the original sequel with Rocky singing it while carrying Frank Furter's body out of the crypt. A guy who played Oscar was in the film version of the Who's Concept album. Janet's father was in Death Wish 3. Ruby Wax, who played Betty, was also in The Final Conflict. And the game show host Bert uh, Skilnick was played by Barry Humphreys, who voiced Bruce the Shark in Finding Nemo, and before that was Dame Edna. I thought Clifty Young did a great job. His Brad was nerdy, and his Farley reminded me of Jack Nicholson. Yeah, that's a good, good call. I saw tri Shock Treatment before I saw the horror Rocky Horror. I saw Rocky Horror at a theater in 85 because it didn't get a video release until 90. I know my comments were long, but I can talk Shock Treatment all day. Keep up the good work, and remember, hoopla, Dave. I, I love Shock Treatment. No problems there, man. I'm sorry about your father. Um, my father is also dead. So, Epic uh, Matio, uh, Matio um, I have not seen your videos in years. Glad to see you're still going strong. Always. Thank you. Nick Mua from Belgium. Rucker Howard was one of, one of a kind for sure. His talent is missed. His art will live on. Though I'm not overly fond of modern day anthologies, the VHS series does have some standout films. I'll be sure to check this one out, especially the Scott Derrickson segment featuring James Ranson. I've been a fan of his work since The Wire. Thanks for bringing this film to our attention, sir. Questions. You obviously love westerns. How do you feel about neo-westerns? I'd rather enjoy Let Em Go, starring Mr. Kevin Costner and Miss D Diane Lane. I like almost anything with the western flair or western style, you know, so I like anything. There's not like I'll see a new western or a western noir or whatever you call it, and I'll dislike it. 
no, I, I like most of that stuff. So, Mr. Costner is also directing Western right now, Horizon, and American Saga. Would you be interested in seeing it, or will you be sticking to the classics? I might. Depends. Um, how do the other Pumpkinhead films compare to the original? I heard they're sort of meh. Two is not great. It has its moments. I remember liking it as a kid. Doesn't mean shit now. I think I would still enjoy part two, honestly. Three and four I never watched. They came out much later. This don't sound like they're my, my thing. Keep rocking the awesome Magnum P.I. action hero Stash Dave. I trust you'll be doing your own stunts. Mm, too old for that. Ilk Vomit 88. You pretty much got all the essential Samo films covered at this point. Only one thing you still haven't seen yet is Magnificent Butcher. And maybe Odd Couple. The latter is widely considered the greatest classical weapons movie ever made. Blu-ray available from Eureka. Thank you. Explosive action. Seeing British people screw was kind of different. Had me laugh on the train, so thanks for that. Yeah, I said that. I, I didn't mean disrespect about it, but it's just really, you don't see British people screw. They're so proper. Um... In movies, at least. Um, then he also says, Demons of Paradise is quality. A serio Santiago. I love all his films. And what a world we live in when three men behind the sun films are in deluxe Blu-ray editions. No shit, right? If you would have told me that 20 years ago. I'd be like, you're insane. You're a crazy person. Get out of my house. Let's watch Men Behind the Sun 2. Okay. Uh, Stoked uh, Scab 1. I hate when people say they do not watch foreign subtitle movies. They usually say because they don't want to read the movie. Some of the best movies are foreign and you miss out on so much. I had the reading skills of a first grader and I still love foreign movies. But yeah, I agree. I hate when people say they don't watch black and white movies as well. Also, he accidentally said Gina Davis in Rocky Horror, but it's Susan Sarandon. I mean, I'm getting old. I'm going to die soon. Art Figaro, Cream of Wheat Man, one of the all-time classic porn skits. Yeah, for sure. He's referring to Night Dreams. Such a weird fucking movie. Um, way up, dude. Uh, he gives me a blooming face and a heart shape. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, let's let's just do the update right here because I'm a lazy boy. So, first up, they had this, like, Sale Friday deal on uh, Makeflix, and it was Killer uh, Killer Nerd Duology. So, it, you get Killer Nerd and Bride of Killer Nerd starring Toby Radcliffe. What is this? Is this Toby Radcliffe? So, you got both of them here. They're signed on here. Um, looks like they're a little uh, Toby Radloff, that is. There you go see the back here tempe video cool stuff i think they are sov but anyways i enjoy having them i i think i've seen the first one for 1991 and i enjoyed it decently or is it 94 and then what else do we got here i know we got another one here oh the blob on 4k the 1988 version i love this movie screen factory put this out um one of the rare times that the remake blows the original out of the water. I like the 58 blob, but it doesn't hold the candle to the 88 blob. There's just no fucking way. Chuck Russell killing it. Great movie. And then last, but certainly not least, we got this Bollywood uh, horror collection from Mondo Macabro. Six films in this bad boy. Uh, yeah, love this stuff. Here's what we got. So if you guys want to look at that, six movies in there, great stuff. First up is, uh, yeah, this is going to be funny for you guys. Um, we'll just do the American, uh, the English versions. Bride of the Vampire, um, Vengeance of the Vampire, The Dungeon, The Monster Wakes, The Haunted Temple, and The Ghost. These are all Ramsey Brother movies, so that's very cool. Very excited. Uh, yeah, I hope they do a volume two. Um, these movies are hard to get, really, in nice editions, English-friendly, so it's very cool that Mondo does this. And Mondo just put up a great pre-sale for a few movies now, too. So anyways, Mondo's probably the most underrated uh, Blu-ray label out there. But anyways, uh, we're out of here, guys. See ya. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching, and as always, have a good one. Me. Mm -hmm.